Hey, what's up, y'all? Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I, I posted this little clip on Twitter showing some, uh, some spiders that I ended up making in Unreal Engine's Niagara particle system uh, tool. And a number of people uh, replied that they were curious to hear more about how it was done and some of the tricks. And so I thought I would do a quick little video to uh, break it down. Um, I'm Eric, by the way. Hi. I make uh, video games and do technical art and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, let's just jump over to Unreal and look at this this horrific, awful, awfulness. Um, so this is uh, just a test scene showing, showing this thing at work. Um, currently... I've got it set up to like spawn when I when I click. This was originally done. It was a, it was a learning exercise, but I actually uh, implemented a, a this little blueprint as a joke, and I, I hid it in the game uh, that we're we're currently working on. Um, uh, and <laughs> the QA department didn't know about it, and it was awesome because uh, managed to get a couple couple folks, uh, you know, in uh, surprised. It was it was the best. Um, I'm going to switch this over to, to sort of emit constantly. One second. Let me just jump into the particle emitter here. Uh, turn off instantaneous. Turn on spawn rate. Switch the emitter state to loop infinitely. So now we should have... There we go. So this thing should just be pooping out spiders. Um, just a couple high-level notes on this. Uh, this is a mesh-based particle system. Um, it is not nearly as complex as it might seem. Uh, holds up really well in a variety of um, observations. It's just creepy. It's still creepy. Uh, up close, it, if, you, if you look too close, you'll see spiders running through each other and you'll see that they don't play super well with the, with the environment, but it's, it's convincing enough. Um, so I'm not gonna go through every detail of this. Um, the main there's, there's three main things I want to touch on that were sort of, I guess, the, the trickier spots, and these are the, these are the areas that I think people are, are the most curious about. One is, uh, uh, this is also meant, I should say, for, um, this isn't like beginner uh, uh, tech art stuff. This is assuming you're very familiar with sort of the fundamentals of, of, of shader uh, uh, building, and you're comfortable with, with basic... Um, uh, linear algebra and, and vector operations and moving things around in the material editor um, and also with sort of some of the some some sort of entry level like uh, HLSL co writing code longhand so this isn't this isn't like newbie level stuff but um, if you're if you're new to this stuff I would encourage you to um, watch it anyway because uh, it it it, the, the concepts are actually all the same to what you'd experience doing stuff in, in the material graph. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a step beyond, and I, I think, honestly, that's where the real power is in this stuff, is learning the fundamentals and learning how to apply them in, in ways that are they're maybe a little more unfamiliar. Um, so let's, let's jump into what this thing is. So this is a single particle. Um, it's a mesh. It's a, I would call it a medium weight particle mesh. It's 257 verts. Um, this thing was was modeled by uh, one of one of our our awesome artists Lance uh, Vermeer, um, and he put together a whole bunch of animals that were meant to be used in particle systems. So they're really nice and lightweight and easy to work with. And so shout out to Lance for this creepy ass spider. Um, let me just look at the wireframe real quick. Uh, like I said, it's I, I I would consider this a medium weight um, particle. Like you could you know it could just be a flat card or legs doesn't don't need to have divisions but the nice thing about this one is um it has some dimensionality to it you know if you look close you can see it's super super low poly it's triangulated and stuff the legs don't even have thickness they're just sort of cupped cards and they're, they're one-sided so this is a, a double-sided shader um and it's really just enough so that when you see this thing in profile like you can you can see it's got its fat little abdomen and the legs it, it's convincing enough it's convincing enough um, the material is what's doing all the work on this thing, though. So that's what's all. All of this is is vertex um, animation. Uh, this is the material. I'll jump in just a little bit here and talk about like, um, kind of fundamentally how it works. Uh, 
really, if you think about the way these legs are moving, I'm going to slow the legs down, by the way. They're moving a little quick. I have the leg speed set to 2.5. I'm going to set it to like 0.25. Maybe that might be too slow. Maybe 0.5. Yeah, we'll do 0.5. Um, so this is this is going to mess up. The, these guys are all going to be like surfing now. The legs aren't moving fast enough. They're just sort of flying. Um, but what it will do is it will give us a better view in here. Uh, and I'm also, I'm also going to go out of full screen so we don't have that like bugging us in the background. Um, so if I can zoom out, what is going on? There we go. So if you look at the way spiders' legs move, um, it's actually pretty straightforward. We're just going to deal with the with with the top down motion at first. Um, they essentially uh, oscillate backwards and forwards, and they alternate uh, so that like the front leg is in the furthest most position when the second leg leg is in the back most position, and then it just alternates. Um, so the the left side is doing the opposite of what the right side is doing, and that continues as you go back through the legs, which is actually really straightforward from a sort of um, algorithmic standpoint. Um, and so in getting this thing to animate, um, it's also all of a very simple motion. If, in fact, if we turn off, I have the leg lift as a separate um, separate thing that I'm adding in. I'm going to remove the, uh, the leg lift for a second. We're just going to look at the uh, the motion of the legs just by itself. So now he's going to just kind of you know skew his legs back and forth. Um, all any of these legs are doing is just a simple rotation around a fixed point, right? Each leg is just rotating around sort of the the what I'll call the shoulder of of the of the leg. Um, and that really couldn't be easier. There's actually uh, a built-in node in Unreal called Rotate uh, About Axis, I think. Yeah, Rotate About Axis. This is a great little node. I, I've used it for a long time. Um, it's it's great. Uh, I I actually prefer to sort of roll my own, and so that's what this node here is. This is um, this is a custom-made Rotate on Axis. It's literally doing the same thing. But um, I, 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 I prefer to write my own because, uh, well, a couple of reasons. Um, when you start to get to do more complex things, uh, the, the thing you need to understand about um, this, this built-in node is this is assuming right off the bat that you're going to be plugging this into the world position offset node, which, which of course I am. But there are cases where this actually gets to be a little bit of a pain in the butt. And what I mean by that is, the world position offset is literally um, an offset from the default position of the vert. So uh, it this has automatically subtracted the initial position for you. This is returning purely the offset, which is which is great if all you need to do is simple stuff. And I could have used it here um, if I wanted to, um, but I would have had to do a second operation to adjust the normals of the mesh, which for any technical artists out there, you already know this, but like if you move verts around using world position offset, that's great. But your your normals are still going to be the default mesh normals, and so unless you account for those, your your lighting is going to be wrong on your mesh. Um, and so what I prefer to do is I write my own node, which it, it operates the same way. It essentially let me let me just take this code real quick and um, bring it into just a text editor here so we can see what it's doing. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I'm basically building a, a, a matrix uh, to multiply the um, position against, and then I'm able to return the position. But um, since I have that matrix built already, I figure I can save myself some instructions by also doing a quick uh, matrix operation against the normal. And so you can say I'm returning as well. This is this is great. This used to this used to be something that was. Um, we had to do in, a, in some custom code, and now Unreal Engine actually provides the ability to do this built in now, which is nice, which is multiple returns. So I can actually get my position out and my normal out in one go, in one sort of one fell swoop, and save some instructions. Um, but I'm, I'm returning in my code, this returns the true world position of the, the new world position of the vert. Um, and uh, I, th this one, like I said, it already subtracts the starting position out. Um, so 
I just need to sort of do the same thing. So you can see I'm subtracting the world position. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm taking the world position and I'm subtracting. Yeah, I had it right the first time. I'm taking my new position, I'm subtracting the world position from it, and that's what I'm what I'm passing on to to the world position offset. Um, sorry for the deep dive on that one, but some people are going to wonder, like, what the heck is this node? Why can't I find it? Um, you can use the other node. It's fine. Um, the other reason I prefer to do it this way and, and not subtract this out is there are times where I need to do complex operations, and, and uh, using my method, I can actually chain these together by taking the... Um, the return position and just plugging it right into the next operation and that allows you to do um, really nice complex uh, sort of transformations of points and then at the very very end as long as you subtract out your absolute world position you're good to go um, and so that's why I'm doing this as a separate operation is because sometimes I like to get fancier with it but uh, this one's pretty straightforward now that said it's a simple operation but the way it's operating in this mesh is actually pretty complex because it's got eight legs and they're all doing different things. And that's where vertex color comes in. So I'm gonna jump over to um, 3 Studio Max. This is the, the mesh of this thing. Uh, I am going to uh, turn off the texture. I'm gonna turn on vertex colors. So this is where all this data is coming from is the vertex colors on this thing. Um, it's actually easier to see if I jump back to Unreal and take the vertex color. I'm going to preview that. So there's our vert vertex color that's coming in. Um, I'm just going to do a real quick, uh, I'm going to make a, a dumb node just so we can isolate each one. So I'm going to start proving. So this is what the red is. The red is, is a mask that I'm using to simply tell the material which verts are going to be moving at all. And it's literally solid white and then the body is solid black. The, the, the white verts are the only ones that can be move, moving. The green channel is uh, what I'm using to alternate the, the oscillation of the legs. So the front pairs of legs are white, then black, then white, then black, because those are that'll synchronize which legs are doing which. And then the very last color, the blue, um, this uh, I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's hard to tell, but the front legs have a value of zero and then a value of point. 3, 3, and then a value of 0. 0.66, and then a value of 1 on the back legs. And I'm doing this um, so that I can, uh, I can tell which legs are which because they all rotate around different points. So I'm using this as a sort of an index to be able to keep track of where my pivot points are because they, all, they, don't, they don't rotate from the center of the body, they rotate from their, like what I was calling the shoulder. Um, I'm going to jump back to uh, Max so we can look at that. Turn off the, the colors real quick. If I can remember how to operate a computer. Um, so these little, uh, uh, I guess, d dummy objects, these little helper objects, um, th this they're not even used in Max. I just put them here um, as a quick way to grab the coordinates. And um, that's really all they're doing. So this, this thing is not skinned. It's just a mesh. Uh, but these little helper objects told me exact coordinates, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, etc. Um, and I just made a note of those. I wrote them down on a, on a post-it note, and I brought them over to, well, you know, digital post-it note, and brought them over to, um, to uh, Unreal. And I have another little bit of custom code. Let's just jump into that first. Well, it's the most complex one, but um, taking the blue channel, and I'm running some custom code here. Let me show this all it's saying is if your value remember i said that the front legs were a value of zero and then and then a third and then two thirds and then one i those are arbitrary values i knew i needed four of them and so i'm just doing a quick little stack of if if else i'm saying hey if x is uh below 0.25 and the only one that fits that criteria are the front legs then your uh, pivot point is 0.7.7 .7. Um, all the pivot points are at the same z height, and so I add that at the end. So I'm just doing 0 0.7, 0 0.7, and then if it's if it's the next one, if it's I, I these are 0.33, which is if if you're if you're not that, but you're under 0.5, you get the idea. So I'm I'm jumping through this and I'm manually setting the pivots in this little block of code, and these are all just conditionals. They're really fast. Um, I am uh, I'm also sending in a little. Uh, I'm using the the local the local space. Uh, uh, what is it? Y, 
uh, axis. And I'm just grabbing a sign value from it, and I'm piping that into the function as well. And that is saying, hey, if you're if you're on the opposite side of the body, just just flip it. So I'm multiplying um, the the sign times by that. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just saying like the opposite sides of the body are going to have inverted pivots in the in the in the y axis. So I'm flipping. Uh, I'm multiplying it by one and the sign that's coming in from from side. Hopefully that makes sense. And then I'm uh, to all of these, I'm literally just appending 0.4, which is the z value of that rotation, which doesn't even matter because it's a I'm using the z axis as my rotation axis. So kind of unnecessary, but I did it anyway. Um, that's what the pivot picker is doing. And so. Uh, in terms of how much to rotate, that's literally just a sine wave with some time, and I'm using you know, multiplying time to control the speed of the legs. Um, I am offsetting uh, that by uh, multiplying that against a lerp using the alternate leg coloring, and I'm, the lerp is just negative one to one. I'm multiplying that, and that's giving me my cool little sine wave, and that's, there's, I mean, then I'm just piping it into this function, right? What's the angle? The angle is, uh, is whatever was defined by the, the sine wave and the direction multiplication and all that. The axis is 0, 0, 1. They're all going on Z. The pivot is whatever is being determined by the pivot picker. Um, and then I'm also, I'm piping the texture uh, normal in as a world space normal. As I talked about earlier, I'm, I'm um, transforming the normal at the same time and then sending that all along. Uh, I'm also doing in a separate operation the leg lift, right? So what we just covered is is handling all of the leg movement that you just saw. It's just a cycle. Um, in terms of the leg lift, though, I'm going to add that back in. What the leg lift is is this is saying, hey, when the legs are moving forward, lift like you're stepping, right? He lifts the spider lifts his legs up. Um, and this is very, very simple. Uh, this, this chunk of code up here is, is probably unnecessarily complex. The key here is adding a, a 0.25 to the, to the sign. Um, the sign uh, function in Unreal um, by default comes in with a period of one, which if you're used to proper um, sign functions, you're used to the period being two pi. Um, but since it's one, it makes this really easy. Uh, let me, I'm going to jump over to, let me see if this thing can work. Um, let's see if I can do iPad. Oh, I can. Sweet. First time I've used this. Let's see how this works. So let's talk about um, the offset sine wave. Um, I'm going to build a quick uh, graph to show, like, if this is my, um, it's going to be one and zero and negative one. And then we're going to show the movement of the legs, right? So that's my, this is my sine wave. And so this, let's call this the, the, the forwardmost point in the step. And this is the backmost point in the step, right? So the, the movement from here down is a sweeping from, from forward and back. That's one forward movement. Well, what I actually want is I want my leg lift to start right here when the when the leg is at its backmost point and I want it to lift up and then drop when it hits the frontmost point, right? Well, this is actually really trivial because what I want is I want a movement of lift that tracks an arc like so. Does that make sense? That looks awfully familiar. That looks a heck of a lot like can I move this thing? No, I can't. Um, that looks a heck of a lot like the 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 arc that I have right here. Um, what's the difference? It's literally one quarter cycle ahead in time. Right? Does that make sense? So I'm going to jump back here. All I'm doing is I'm taking my uh, my time signature. You can see right here is the sine wave that I'm using to to make the oscillation back and forth. I'm just adding 0.25 to that, and I'm using immediately another sine wave, and that is and that is that is lifting the leg up. Now, you can see here I'm I'm uh, I, I had some offsets in here, and the, this is this this is to to uh, uh, 
you can see I'm taking the sine and the negative one, positive one lerp that I'm doing. This just gets the leg lifts to be the right opposite side and, and offset for each leg. Um, but then you can see that almost immediately, the next thing I'm doing is I'm saturating it, and uh, which is just a, a zero to one clamp. If you're not familiar with saturate, um, it's, it's, a, it's a simple clamp operation, zero to one. Um, and I'm doing that because I don't want my leg to lift up and then go underground, right? I don't want it to go under the ground. And so a saturate just says, hey, clamp that at the zero value, boom, right? So leg hits the floor, stops, stays on the floor until it gets to the next part of the cycle, lifts up again. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, that's the leg lift. Um, I'm transforming everything into world space because it's just far easier um, to, to handle it that way. Um, uh, and then, you know, one last little thing about the material, and this is this is a, um, a big shout out to uh, one of the Epic devs that, um, this was an answer on UDN, uh, Matt Oztale. Um, he, this is not my question. He was responding to another uh, developer's question about uh, getting flickering on particle meshes. And it was something I was struggling with for, for weeks uh, with, with some other assets, not the, the, not the spiders. But um, this, getting this black flickering. And it turns out uh, that unless you inject this little bit of code um, that just says, uh, if compiler HLSL uh, return, make precise, um, you can get black flickering on, on meshes. So if, if you're doing complex particle mesh animation and you're getting like a, almost like a Z fighting, um, but it shows up even in like the, the unlit mode, um, this use precise thing is, uh, is the key. And so now I just sort of add this on any mesh particle that I'm doing, uh, vertex animation to. Anyway, that was a lot to say about the, the mesh particles. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, these guys are still over here doing their thing. Um, all right. Oh yeah, this is gonna be a long one. Sorry, we're like 20 minutes in already. Um, let's talk about the the emitter itself. This is it's a pretty basic emitter. Um, there's only two things that I think we need to talk about uh, that are special to what's going on here, right? Um, I'm gonna turn the I'm gonna turn the animation speed back up because these guys are far too slow now. Leg speed, 2.5 is what we had it set to. So get their creepy crawl back. There we go. Okay, so I just went over to the material graph and I, and I put the leg speed back to 2.5. So they're crawling. Um, the two things I want to talk about in the material emitter are uh, getting the spiders to traverse the scene, meaning like to crawl on objects in the scene. That's done using uh, the global distance field and uh, getting them to be aware of each other, which uh, was, was, was tricky and um, getting that to work helped a lot. So in terms of getting them to traverse the scene, uh, they are, if I show visualize global distance field, you can see this is the global distance field of this scene. Um, I have this cranked pretty high right now in terms of um, distance. If I look at the world settings, you can see my global distance field is set to 1,000, which is very short. The reason for that is um, I, want, I want fidelity of these meshes so that the spiders seem to crawl um, pretty accurately on it. And uh, it is failing already. You can see them crawl. If you look close, this is showing the mistakes of this. But it's not really set up to handle hard corners like this very well. Um, it works great on rounded surfaces. It works if I were to... If I were to chamfer these cylinders, it would work just great. Um, but this has a hard time um, with with hard corners like this because um, that that detail you can see already. It's just it's kind of mushy in the in the global distance field. Um, I have not modified the default global distance field resolution. I think the default is 128, and that's cube cubic. So 128 by 128 by 128. Um, I've I've heard that you can take it up to like 256 without too much trouble. But remember. It, it's it's a ton of data and a ton of computation. And the, the global distance field is being rebuilt on the fly as you fly through the scene in a local space around the camera. So I didn't want to push my luck. Um, what I did instead was I just lowered the distance of the distance field. Um, this comes with some drawbacks. What I mean by that is, uh, where did my spiders go? Uh, 
Um, what I mean by that is uh, if I back up, you're going to see the spiders start to like disappear and explode. Um, the reason for that is when I get back here, you can see they, they get all flickery and disappear. If I switch back to my global distance field, look what happens when I get far away. The distance field just sort of disappears. It's because I have this distance set to a thousand. Okay, well let's, you know, just for the sake of doing it, I think the default on this is like really high. It's like it's like twenty thousand. Okay, cool. Now I can oh I can go way back here. Sweet. That's great. But I had twenty thousand, look at this thing. It's just a it's just a mess. It's there's not much fidelity. Um, if I switch back, I'm gonna just recompile the thing. Look at what these guys are doing now. They're just going through the surface and um, so it's a trade off. Uh, I, I found that a global distance field of like a thousand was was pretty good. You can see they immediately just kind of snapped to where they're supposed to be. I could let me try five thousand. Yeah, that's not so bad either, and that'll give us a little more distance before they explode, so I can back up a little further. But you can see this corner of the cylinder is where they're really failing, and it's that hard corner. So I don't have a great solution. Um, these are running on the GPU, and so the only way they can really um, ask the scene like hey what am i crawling on is that global distance field it has its uses it has its limitations and just be aware of it um but let's get to the point which is how the heck are they talking to the world um they're doing that via a little script that i wrote in here it's very very simple and it's based on um if you type in uh distance field if you type it right distance field there's a there's a there's a note in here called move to nearest distance field surface gpu um, dig in there, take a look what they're doing. It's 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 a little over overly complicated. Um, all I'm doing is this. Um, I'm saying, uh, hey, sample the global distance field, find the nearest distance field, and grab the position and the vector to that nearest distance field. And then I'm I'm literally taking the out of the position, um, and I am uh, uh, I'm doing a little a little extra step here which is I have an offset distance this is user a user setting um, let me show you what that does uh, the offset distance oh <laughs> that's right I have it I have it parameterized so that you can you can edit it right on the right on the um, I thought I did oh maybe if I was in the details panel yeah offset distance zero so if I set this to like 20 now they're all 20 units off the surface, right? They're, and I just did this to, to if I felt like I needed to adjust the, the height. Um, zero, if I go negative five, you'll see they're all like, um, well, they're probably under the surface now. Yeah, there they are. So hopefully that makes sense. I, I just added a little a little uh, utility to, to lift them or sink them as needed. Um, and I didn't really need to. They were pretty good as is. Um, so that's all this is. Uh, I'm multiplying that by uh, the, the Z... The, the local Z, um, adding that back in. And I'm just returning that as the particle's position. So I'm, I'm force setting every frame. I'm force setting each particle's position based on the distance of that distance field. Um, and that's why when I back away and the distance field data gets a little hinky, they disappear because they, they don't have data to go to. And so who knows where they're flying, probably into the, into the a million units into the background or something. I don't know. Um, uh, and then, but this is the important part here. Um, is I'm solving for the facing of the distance field. And I'm doing that um, just by using some cross products uh, to, to sort of rebuild their own local facing. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, every particle, as it's crawling along the surface, it knows where it's supposed to be, and it knows the direction to that surface. But as it moves along the surface, I want to I wanna update that as it goes so that it, so that it crawls correctly. Um, if I don't do that, let me see if I can, if I can simulate what I don't, uh, I'm, I'm doing it all in one go. Yeah, I'm setting, I'm setting the, the forward vector and the mesh orientation and I'm, I'm doing it all in one step because I don't, you know, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but I will talk briefly about what all these cross products are, are all about. Um, and this is super handy. It's a nice little trick. Let me jump back over to uh, the iPad. Let me do one of these. So let's pretend that this is um, the surface that it's crawling on, and let's uh, let's say the this is the the body of the spider right here, 
and this is the direction the spider's facing. So, um, actually, let's 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 pretend that it's it's here and it's and it's facing a little bit more level, right? This is like frame one or something. Uh, that operation I just showed you is it's saying, hey, this is the center of my particle. Um, or the pivot of the particle. It's 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 actually at the at the feet level, but for the purposes of this explanation, um, the data that I have that I'm getting from the um, from the the system is the vector from the center of the particle to the surface, um, and the 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 position at that surface. So what I want to do is I want to rebuild basically the forward facing direction of the of the particle. Um, using the only information I have, which is uh, the the direction it's currently facing and the and the accurate down direction, and so well, how do I how can I rebuild every frame this that which is what I want the true like the the, the tangent facing of of where it is in the surface, um, and that's what all those cross products are about. So this pretty uh, handy trick is if you if you have two directions of an orientation, you could sort of rebuild the whole thing. Um, and what I mean by that is you can take this vector, this this down vector, I'm just going to draw it from the side. That's the that's the direction to the surface. We're going to call that our local Z. Um, and you can take your current facing to sort of give you a general idea of where you were coming from and which way front is. So for the purposes of of this, let's say it's like straight sideways. Right, we're going to call that our our x direction or our our starting x, our s x. Starting x direction. Um, in order to rebuild our our true our new x direction, um, if you take those two vectors and you build a cross product from them, they're going to give you a perpendicular vector, um, regardless of of how close or far those are, as long as they're not parallel or, or perfectly opposing, it, it'll, it'll build you an orthogonal vector from the side, which in this case, you're going to have to pretend it's pointed straight at us from here. I'll just, I'll, I'll build it sort of in a three quarter, right? It's coming straight at us. Um, and that gives you an accurate like side, right? That's like, it's, that's like it's side facing. It's, it's, it's local Y. Um, you can then basically throw away your original starting X vector and just build a new cross product between the Z and the Y. And that will give you a, uh, your proper, your proper X direction. Um, cross product operations are really cheap um, and they're really handy. And that way, sort of as it's going along the surface, it knows what the proper down is. It knows what it's sort of forward is. And so every frame it can rebuild its accurate, its accurate forward. Um, I'm sure there's actually like mathematicians out there that could explain it in a far better way than I can, but um, that's what that's doing. And that's how these guys are crawling along the surface. That's how they're reorienting when they, when they hit this lip, right? Um, super handy. And I'm basically just rebuilding that new cross product, and then I am um, using it to uh, build a quaternion, which is a rotator, and, and pass that along to the mesh orientation. So that's reorienting the mesh particle every frame. Um, and then the last thing that I'm doing that's worth talking about in this anyway, is uh, getting, um, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the forward crawl real quick. Um, the thing that makes these so creepy is unlike normal particles, they're not, they're not being driven by external force i mean they are they're being influenced by external forces they're being influenced by um sort of a noise field and they're being influenced by a a attraction a linear force i i, I can also i can use other uh i can use point attractors so let's say for instance i wanted them all to to sweep to one side i'm just going to enable a point attraction force that i have in here and now this should yeah there we go so they're all going to sort of like seek to a to a point that happens to be over on that side um, or if i if i switch the uh point attraction force to be the other side same thing other side right so that's what's so great about this system is they can be they can be influenced by physical simulation um makes it super easy to work with uh but what's what makes them so creepy is like no matter how powerful this point attraction force is it won't pull them in like a vacuum 
Um, and the reason for that is I'm moving them not based on external forces, but I actually have this forward crawl in here. This is dead easy. Uh, in that in that previous one, when I was when I was figuring out its orientation, I'm passing along its forward vector as a particle property. And then in here, I'm literally just taking the forward vector and a user-defined forward crawl speed, and I'm literally just setting its velocity immediately after figuring that out. And what this does is it means that the particles are pushing themselves. They're never going to go faster than their crawl speed, and they're never going to get, like, like I said, sucked in like a gravity well, but they're actually self-propelled. Each one is a little remote control car that's moving at his own speed. And um, the speed is variable. You know, I'm, I think I'm populating it with a minimum and maximum. Um, but that means, you know, if I want all these particles, I'm going to turn off that, that, uh, I'm going to turn off that point attraction force so they can just go forward again. Um, you know, if I want them all to go 100, they're all going to go 100. If I want, if I want them all to go between 10 and 20, now they're real slow. Um, and so that makes them super controllable and like art directable, right? Um, that's 500. That's a little quick. 50 and 100. And, and that's part of what makes them uh, so effective is they're they, like a real spider. It's moving under its own power. And so it's a very simple trick, but I, I, I'm just setting its velocity based on its, uh, its orientation and a, and a preset speed. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is this, uh, this repel others gag. Um, let me show what this does first, and then I'll explain um, how it was pulled off. Um, most particle systems in Niagara... Uh, they're just doing their, each particle is doing its own thing and it might get information from the, the system, but there's not a whole lot of in, inter-particle interaction going on. Um, and in this, uh, in this scenario, I have the ability to, um, have the spiders be aware of the other spiders. So I just pushed this thing called repel distance up a little bit to, to 20. And you can, you can see how they're, they're, they're giving each other a little bit more breathing room, right? They don't like, they don't like to be around the other, the, 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 uh, the other guys. If I set it higher, they, it almost starts to get like algorithmic looking, right? Cause they're, you know, they're, they're really kind of staying away. Um, and I thought 10 was a good distance. Um, really it's just like, how do they feel like a creepy bunch of spiders? Um, repel strength too, right? If I, if I dial that up, they will run away from each other. And if you see two of them getting too close, you can actually watch them sort of like veer, veer off, right? Um, if I set it, if I set it very strong, well, it might break the system, but you can actually really watch them course correct now if they start to get near each other, sort of, you know, juking back and forth. And that's part of what makes it so creepy. Um, so, What's going on here is that uh, every particle in the system actually knows about every other particle in the system. Um, and there are, there are certainly more efficient ways to do this, but this is a GPU system, and um, GPUs are incredibly uh, uh, powerful when it comes to simple operations like this. And so if you think about... The amount of well, let me let me let me show what the code is doing first, and then we'll talk about the impact on on computation. But um, this this is using these uh, this new feature that's in um, Niagara, the last couple of versions, um, particle attribute reader, right? And this is it's it's a a uh, sort of a data struct that you can get access to, and you you currently you need to really access this via um, custom HL, HLSL, uh, code blocks. Uh, I believe that they are implementing more ways to interact with this in the, in the future, but for now, this is, this is the best way to do it. And it's, it's really not that hard. Let me show, um, this code first. All right. So let's look at what's going on and then I'll jump over to the code. Um, I'm, I'm getting some information from the system. I'm getting this uh, particle attribute reader, passing it into this custom node. I'm getting the position, the velocity, and then some user settings like the repel distance and the repel strength. Um, and all I'm looking to get out of this is a velocity, and that's all I'm returning back. So what is the code doing? The code is saying, uh, hey, for, X, for, for num, number of particles, for n number of particles, um, you're gonna you're gonna do a loop 
And so it, for every particle in the system, it runs this code. It loops through every other particle currently in the system, and it gets that other particle's uh, position. Um, quick, quick shout out, by the way. This, like, even even getting to, you know, use this code and figuring out how it works and the particle uh, particle attribute reader. This stuff is not very well documented yet. And there is a, a guy on YouTube. If you're not following him, I highly recommend it. Uh, CG Howe is the name of his channel. Um, his name is Asif Ali. And uh, I have to say, he is on the forefront of digging into new features in Unreal and um, doing a really good job explaining um, some of the lower level functionality uh, and, and utility that I don't see anybody else there out there on the internet talking about it in a, in a public setting. Um, and so things like this partic particular function, the get vector by index, um, all this is, and he explained this on his channel better than I can, but uh, in a particle attribute reader, you can get, you can get a whole bunch of stuff out of this attribute reader, but get vector by index is a function and he covered how to use that function in the custom code and uh, and you know it's the the structure of the function is very much based on the structure of this node, but um, it's nice to have people out there talking about the usage of this stuff. And so, uh, big shout out to Asif and thank you. And uh, I don't know if you're gonna see this, but uh, love your stuff and keep it up. Good work. Um, so what this function is doing is it's stepping through every other particle and it is storing the position of that other particle. And then just some basic stuff like, hey, build a vector uh, from the other one, uh, figure out what the distance that, that vector is. Uh, and then I'm using that distance between the other particle and the current particle. Um, I'm building a basically an inverse gradient um, so that I have a zero to one gradient that is more, it's, it's white when they're close and it's black when they're far away. And uh, I'm turning that into an inverse square fall off so that the, the repel strength is, is stronger when, it's, when the two spiders are close and it's weaker uh, and, and it's, it's zero after a certain distance. Um, and then I'm basically stepping through every particle and I'm adding uh, just a little bit of push, just a little bit of, of, of um, velocity push away from the other particle when they're within a certain distance. And I, I just cycle through every particle and I spit that back out as velocity. Um, and that is enough. It's, you know, it's not going to be physically accurate a simulation or anything like that, but it is, it is accurate enough to get um, super convincing uh, flocking behavior. Um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can further complicate this. You know, I could, I could uh, if I wanted to, I could say, hey, let's, let's repel others. Um, let's repel a distance of 30, strength of 10. So now they're really... They're really pushing, pushing apart. But you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually duplicate this node since I set it up as a customizable thing. And I'm going to say, hey, but if you're within 10, I actually want you to uh, huddle together. So I'm going to give a negative, negative repel value. I don't know if this will work or not. This might, this might start to blow things up. Ooh, they don't like that at all. Turn this down a little bit. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get little uh, little clusters where they'll sort of generally repel from each other. But they might flock together a little more. So there's, they're, they're pushing away from ones farther away, but when you get within close distance of, so say, three, take that up a little bit to five, they're going to they're gonna huddle together. So you can see these three guys are sort of sticking together. I can't tell if that's working well or not. But the flexibility of this is great. Um, all kinds of stuff you can do. You can add a, I could add a vortex force. So now the particles are going to be spiraling because they have a vortex force operating on them as well. Hopefully this makes sense. You can all, you can use all the basic physical uh, 
uh, force operators um, to influence the movement of the, the flock, <laughs> the flock of spiders. Uh, but they're always going to feel right because of the way I'm moving them, because they're being sort of self-driven, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, at this point, we're just in goofing around land, so... Um, not sure there's a whole a whole ton else to add. Um, hopefully this was this was uh, interesting for for unreal artists out there. Um, seriously though, if you're if you're like a like a, a just starting out in in technical art, um, don't be afraid of don't be afraid of code. Uh, it's learn to love it. It, it can it, you can you can do some awesome stuff. And it's really not that complex. If you're if, if you're like a crazy shader graph guy and you're used to building you know spaghetti code all day, um, yeah, it, it, learn to love this stuff because it can clean up your code and it's really not any harder than what you're already doing. You just got to learn the syntax. So um, anyway, I think I'll leave it here. Uh, I think this might actually be the first video I'm going to post on my own YouTube channel as well instead of the the cyan one. So. Um, if this is uh, interesting, let me know. If you'd like to see more of this kind of nonsense, let me know. Um, I sure love, I sure love doing it. Um, I also should state, the spider thing was was really more of a like. Oh, I think I can pull this off. The, the, we're not putting a whole bunch of spiders in in any of our games. Um, maybe unless we are. There's not really a plan for it, but maybe I need to find one. Um, Anyway, that's it. Uh, if you if you use any of the stuff that we went over and you're and you want to show it off, um, tag me. Find me on Twitter. My that's the user handle is the same as my YouTube page thing. So um, I would love to see what you're working on. And uh, that's it. All right, I'm gonna hit the stop thing. How long is this? 45 minutes. What's wrong with me? All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. <laughs>